has experienced a huge surge in popularity over the last year, but specifically the Pokemon trading card game. Since September of 2020, Pokemon cards have seen a massive explosion in their value, largely due to a little website called YouTube. Pokemon card. Pokemon card. Pokemon card. Pokemon. 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 The major cause of this boost in popularity is pretty much down to one single YouTube creator, Logan Paul. He's one of the strongest YouTube Pokemon trainers around and has captured and tamed some of the most legendary YouTube Pokemon in the game. Logan, a childhood Pokemon fan whose love for the franchise goes so deep that he even ended up getting a tattoo of a Squirtle right next to his Weedle. <laughs> All of a sudden, Pokemon cards are now being touted as a solid investment opportunity, and every popular YouTuber, streamer, and entrepreneur wants a piece of the action. So with the help of some of the internet's biggest Pokemon experts, I'm gonna take a look at whether this hype train can actually continue, and whether what was once a fun hobby has now been turned into something where the only motivation is to make money. So join me on this nostalgic journey as we look into how YouTube has truly changed Pokemon. So firstly, let me introduce the Pokemon experts. First up is Gary the Charizard King. Some of you may recognize him from an episode of Porn Stars from 2017, where he showed the world his empire of first edition Charizard cards, which is now said to be the most expensive collection in the world. Next up is S.M. Pratt, one of the pioneers of modern day Pokemon card collecting. He was considered a Pokemon card prodigy in his late teens, and he's also the founder of E4, the biggest Pokemon card forum in the world. Up next is Mr. Fuji, known to many in the Pokemon card community by his Instagram username, Mr. Fuji has one of the most diverse card collections in the Pokemon world. He spent years traveling the globe and finding the rarest Pokemon cards in the wild, and as his collection keeps growing, so does his reputation. Lastly is Swole Poke, a mountain of a man with the strength to take on the best of the best. Possessing some of the strongest and rarest Pokemon cards in the world, Swole knows the game inside and out. So for those that don't know me, you may have seen some of my videos occasionally on the internet. In fact, that's one of mine at the start of Logan's first Pokemon video. But alongside being another irrelevant commentary YouTuber, much like Logan, I'm also an avid Pokemon card collector. However, what Logan doesn't tell you is that Pokemon cards are not an obsession, they're an addiction which can get a little out of hand. However, for most of us, our first introduction to Pokemon wasn't through the trading card game. For many, the Pokemon journey started in the late 90s with the original Nintendo Game Boy. In 1998, Pokemon Red and Blue were released for North America and Europe on the Game Boy. That was followed by the release of Pokemon Yellow around a year later, and then shortly thereafter came the Gold and Silver games. Playing Pokemon for hours on end on the Game Boy was pretty much the pinnacle of a good time for many of us millennials in the late 90s. Alongside the release of the Game Boy games came the anime series. Now this was the go-to program for most kids to watch either before school or over the weekend. Then, of course, came the Pokemon trading card game. Pokemon cards would absolutely dominate the school playground, and the art of the trade was the key tool for any kid to get the best stack of cards. Now, sadly, the magic of trading Pokemon cards has pretty much died, and it's, it's not quite the same as it once was, and for my sake, Maybe that was for the best as I was absolutely bloody useless at it. Despite opening hundreds of packs as a kid, I never ended up pulling a Charizard. So at nine years old, the young entrepreneur in me really came out. And instead of trying to trade my cards for a Charizard, I decided I was gonna conduct a business deal. I offered a kid 10 pounds for his Charizard, to which he gladly accepted. One week later, I then traded that same Charizard back to the same kid for a Rhydon, a very basic jungle set Rhydon. 
It was the first time I'd ever seen a card from the jungle set, so I assumed it was super rare and gladly swapped my Charizard for it. So that kid not only got a tenor from me, but he also got his Charizard back. So trading was clearly never my strong point, but I wasn't the only one. Yeah, I remember when I was younger, I traded a Mr. Mime, and I think it was an air version, like the jungle one where it doesn't have the symbol. I remember trading that for like a Mewtwo Black Star promo that some guy got in like a VHS or DVD, and I just never saw it before. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to make that trade. And like today, the Mr. Mime is definitely worth a lot more. It got so bad here in the States that schools banned Pokemon. And this is like uh, February 1999. They banned Pokemon, wouldn't allow them on the on, you know, in the schools because there were there was too many cases of people making bad trades, parents getting angry, parents showing up to the school and saying, you know, my son had a Charizard and now he has this ride on and, uh, you know, things like that. And the schools got fed up. So they banned Pokemon for probably a year. No Pokemon allowed on campus on any of this any of our schools one particular card i was uh, eyeing for uh, a not ages but weeks let's say a month and it's the birthday pikachu number two and nobody in france has them or in paris where where we met our friend and everything and when the guy just opened the binder he has like two three pages of uh, that card I, I was i was a kid but i i knew i had to go for it so what i did was fairly uh, straightforward i went to those shops I sold all my cards and you know to shop they they buy for nothing but I was so happy to to get this card I was ready to go for it and uh, I gave like I don't know maybe 80% of what I have at that time so trading and swapping cards isn't really part of the game for most collectors instead we now trade our cold hard cash for cards. A recent article showed how eBay had reported a 500% increase in sales on Pokemon cards over the course of 2020, and part of that boom is down to the Logan Paul effect. But eBay has always been a busy market for buying Pokemon cards long before the most recent popularity boost. The challenge now is that with these rising prices, it's getting harder to find good deals. The reason for this is because sellers are jacking up prices to match the rest of the market. Now I have to say, I am slightly guilty of doing the same thing recently. I bought an old Blastoise card that's not very popular in mid-2019 for £125. I then sold that same card just over a year later for £1,350. Businessman of the year. That's a 980% increase in value, and this makes a lot of sense given the current market statistics. According to Pokemon analyst ZNG Emporium, the price of PSA 10 cards from the base set increased by 96% in the months following Logan's first Pokemon video. Now this really shows how much he actually impacted the market. But the reality is cards weren't always this expensive. Some of the biggest collectors have got some amazing stories from years ago about picking up Pokemon cards for a relatively cheap price when compared to what you would pay for them today. A big year that stands out for me and a lot of collectors was the year 2015 or 2016. I had bought a Trophy Kangaskhan for $2,000 in USD and I sold it for $3,000 USD just because it got a PSA 9 and I wanted a 10. Recently a PSA 9 copy sold with PWCC for I believe um, a little over $100,000. <laughs> And a PSA 10 sold for 150000 but even then, I think the price has doubled since then. I remember buying first edition base Charizards all day for a couple hundred dollars and selling them for like $300 PSA 9 was a big deal. Like, And then they got to $1,000 PSA 9, which was like, you know, balling out of control. So, you know, today, like you can put like a couple zeros on the back of that and, you know, that's what they're going for now. So, yeah, there's... We can sit here for hours, but yeah, you don't even have to go that far back, like five years, PSA 9, lots of house, 20, 30 bucks. And yeah, 10 years, 15 years ago, like when there was nobody around, you could pick up pretty much anything with a few thousand dollars. You could really get pretty much majority of the, you know, the main set items that were out there. I saw the card like a few years back and I got this copy for, I think, $200. It's uh, today is a steal. 
and the last record sale was over 20,000 just for one card like this. So, seeing as we're on the topic, let's talk about Charizard. For many people, a first edition Charizard is the sexiest Pokemon card in the game. Right now, the prices of Charizards are soaring. Logan Paul paid a very small sum of $150,000 for one in October of 2020, which at the time became a record, but that's since been broken. Firstly, by rapper Logic, who paid $226,000 at an auction for the card, but that was then smashed when a buyer paid $369,000 for the card. Once again, showcasing the impact Logan Paul has had on the Pokemon card market. Now, Logan, like many others, considered Charizard to be the ultimate card in the hobby, which many, of course, will agree with, but there are other cards in the game that aren't as well known, but are considered to be much rarer and far more difficult to get your hands on. Rare cards aren't from a pack. Like, that's a simple starting point. Uh, the rarest cards are going to be given out in either a tournament, some type of controlled release where they have a limited amount. Uh, in Pokemon, we're lucky, I have one sitting over here. This is my lucky University Magic card. Uh, this was only given out in 1998 at the Tamamushi University contest over in Japan. You basically took a quiz or a test for a couple of days and this was the award you received. So that was the only way it was awarded. And according to documentation, a thousand was like the intended distribution. But of course, like we've only seen a fraction of that over, over 20 years. But that's just one example of a card that is light years rarer than Charizard. Since we mentioned the, the Charizard, the first edition best set uh, English, I'll show you the, the counterpart, the Japanese counterpart. So <clears throat> the narrative, just to uh, give you a, a little crash course, <laughs> crash uh, things, it, it lacks here the symbol of rarity where you have it on every card. And also the weight and the height are different on the Japanese uh, narrative copy. And if you consider consider it, there are only that's the the first ever card with the depiction of Charizard on the of the TCG. I feel Charizards are first the one constant, the one like I said the value increases you know never went down just kept going up and up and up in popularity and value is the Charizards. You could never go wrong you know with those cards. I don't care what condition. I don't care what series they were from the charizards uh yeah they they're definitely that i go for signed cards specifically i go for ken sugimori so as people know ken sugimori let's see ken sugimori is the man behind the first 151 pokemon he single-handedly created them he was given you know these 8-bit pixel arts of each pokemon and he brought them to life. And he's the reason why we have the Pokemon we have today. Um, and so the thing about him that makes his signature such a holy grail is that he hasn't done a public signing for any cards since 2007. And so signatures, I think are a little underappreciated right now, but um, you know, if you were to go onto eBay or even go onto a Facebook group, finding Ken Sugimori's signature is near impossible. It's just, they're not available and the only people who have them to this day were the people who attended and competed in the world championship. So, Kangashkan Family Event from 1998, as it's uh, it mentioned, is a family event. So, people, family, they they go there with their kids, they play, and at the end, they they get rewarded, uh, rewarded this card, and it's believed that there are only a hundred copy of this. So these incredibly rare cards we've just seen are very, very special, but with the huge price tag that comes with them in the hundreds of thousands, it's now led to people getting involved in Pokemon simply as investors. Well-known entrepreneur Gary Vaynerchuk is a good example of this. According to Logan Paul, it was actually Gary Vaynerchuk who was the person that tipped him off to start buying Pokemon cards again. However, investors that may only be getting involved for the profits also have to be really careful because with the prices so high, there are a lot of people trying to make a quick buck and there are plenty of scammers in the market. The now infamous example of one of the biggest Pokemon scams in history was on a live stream hosted by the YouTube channel Dumb Money Live. Dumb Money are a group of three wealthy individual investors who decided to invest in the Pokemon hype and bought a sealed first edition Pokemon base set box 
for $375,000. However, what unfolded was quite, um, well, you'll see. Beautiful. Looks good in this. We move the first couple packs. Let's see how we do. Here Let's we make it $19.99 again. Very nice. What are we looking for underneath those packs would be bad? The same pack. Oh, the same thing. The same we want pack. the same Does it say first edition? Uh, yeah. Yes, that's perfect. Keep going. Woo! Keep going. Keep going. Oh, the color's different on that one than that one. That one's the... not a first edition pack. <gasps> that's Wait, an what? issue. This is an unlimited pack. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, God. look, they're open. Yeah, no, that's oh. a major fucking issue. This is a resealed box. Oh my box. god, it's a resealed box. All right, time to call the seller. Yeah, no money back on that. Oh, it's not even base set cards. Oh my god, these are jungles. Wow. Well, that's lovely. Time wow. Time to call the seller. Yep. Wow. This is oh a resealed box. The man brokering the deal in the video is a gentleman who goes by the name of Collectibles Guru. After the box opening turned out to be a scam, many pointed the finger at Collectibles Guru due to his suspicious reaction once he found out they were opening the box right there and then live on YouTube. Many people at the time of the live video were also writing in the comments section that Collectibles Guru was a scammer before the box had even been opened. Now, Pokemon card collectors are part of a big community on Instagram, and it's rare to see these collectors flashing cash, cars, and expensive watches alongside their Pokemon cards, something that Collectibles Guru does on a regular basis. As a result, he's now become the face of scamming within the Pokemon card community. That fellow is a, is a total cancer. Uh, I've spoken to Logan three, four times about this, you know, to let him know don't let this guy in your house. Don't let him into your videos. I said the attention, the good stuff that you're doing in that, he's going to suck up a lot of the attention. And then people are going to, uh, are, that's going to reflect bad on you, uh, yeah. on Logan. And, uh, you know, he listens to me about a lot of things, but he doesn't listen to me about that because the other day with this other box break, he actually had, collectibles guru jake is his name he actually yeah. had him come to his house buy a pack and uh and sure sure enough it uh you know it did it didn't do him any good at all so the whole fake box opening situation raised an important question and that's whether there could actually be many other sealed pokemon boxes on the market that could also be fraudulent simply as there's no way of authenticating their contents you're very right about that a lot of people don't realize it either that even going back to 1999, there were rewraps and, you know, there were scammers even in the very beginning. People seem to think that it's a new thing, but like you said, it absolutely is not. It, it's just a mixture of unknown variables. But again, majority of the time, I think boxes are more than fine. You see people like PokeRev and all these guys who are opening up stuff pretty much every week, every month. And if you do like a statistical analysis on it, it's probably like, 99% you know of it is fine. It's always just that exception. And of course you don't want to be in that scenario. Uh, but yeah, I would say overall, it's, it's not at a state yet where you really have to like pull the fire alarm and, you know, really worry about every box you purchase. The thing is that even back in the day when Pokemon was not as famous as today, we had this issue already. So with the demand, and the popularity and the hype that Pokemon has gained today, I think there are people, they're worried about the collection and maybe they start considering that they might have bought some boxes, they might be uh, uh, fraudulent. Scamming will always happen. There's always someone out there who's trying to make a quick buck on some person who doesn't have the knowledge to protect themselves. Um, but like I said, research, 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 and just before buying anything, get a second opinion, go on a website, YouTube, just take the time to protect yourself. That's the best thing you could do. Who's that Pokemon? It's Squirtle! Squirtle, Squirtle. Pokemon on YouTube is like an ice cream store. Any flavor you want, they've got it. If you want gaming, they've got it. If you want animation, they've got it. If you want a man having a Pokemon card orgasm, they've got it. The reality is though, the Pokemon card community on YouTube has been going for years. Popular channels like Max Mofo Pokemon, for example, have been uploading card pack openings for nearly 10 years. 
So the foundation has always been there, but 2020 really was the year for Pokemon on YouTube. In fact, according to YouTube themselves, there were more than 1 billion views across the site on videos about Pokemon cards. So while Logan played a vital role in sparking this Pokemon card renaissance across the internet, he's not the only cause. Having spoken in depth to the Pokemon experts you see in this video, they explain that there have been other sparks within the Pokemon universe long before Logan Paul that helped to keep the franchise popular but also helped to increase the price of cards. Pokemon Go's release in 2016 sparked massive attention across the globe and as we all now know, it became one of the most popular crazes of the last 10 years. It effectively helped to reconnect millions of people with the franchise they were in love with when they were kids. Another important moment came in 2017 when Gary went onto the American TV show Porn Stars showcasing his collection of Charizards and how much they were actually worth. That moment has now been viewed over 12 million times on YouTube and ended up leading to hundreds of thousands of people going to check the back of their wardrobes to see if they still had their old Pokemon cards. So there were certainly other key moments that helped to re-maintain Pokemon cards popularity and really help people rediscover their love for the trading card game. But perhaps another key moment that really helped to start this newfound trend of opening first edition packs and boxes came in May of 2020. The clip I showed before is from a video by Pokemon YouTuber Leon Hart. In the clip, he pulls a first edition base set Charizard from a pack and his reaction to this moment was just unbelievable and it ended up going viral, but perhaps Above all else, it truly showcased the real spirit and essence of what Pokemon card collecting is all about. But then came the big moment. Logan Paul decided to enter the Pokemon card market and it seemed to be the spark that would take things to another level. He started by buying a first edition base set box and sold off the packs and opened them live on YouTube. Then a month later, after a long fought battle with Gary, he caught one of his PSA 10 first edition Charizards for $150,000. Once he caught the Charizard, he said he was done with Pokemon card collecting, but he kind of lied. As a result of his actions, the market went into overdrive. He then came back with a video and spent $2 million buying as many first edition base set boxes as possible and sold off the packs inside for an average of $38,000 making a pretty nice profit from it. Since then, the internet has gone crazy for Pokemon cards like it was 1999 again. Pokemon YouTubers have seen a huge surge in popularity and subscribers, and they've started to introduce the hobby and their love of Pokemon cards to a completely new audience, which is really what it's all about. Creators like Randolph have seen massive growth across his channel. Leon Hart, who I mentioned earlier, has gained nearly 1 million subscribers in under a year, but the real question is how much has YouTube actually changed Pokemon cards and can the hype continue? Without YouTube, uh, this would not be the biggest franchise in, in the history of the world. You know, YouTube pretty much made, you know, not, not only made a lot of the influencers in all the different categories, but it, it really, it really helped make Pokemon, you know, the, cause the resurgence. But yeah, I, I think I could say I could safely say that just about every one of those sparks you're talking about, even the ones well before, you know, way before all this, uh, was thanks to YouTube. I think you know, as millennials continue to grow older and they make more money, I, I think Pokemon's going to continue to grow, and I think it's only ever grown at a healthy rate. I don't think any of this is inorganic or inflated i think you know prices have never dropped i think 2007 or 2008 was the last time pokemon had a a, a crash and since then it's been a very steady growth in the past 10 years i've seen it even though prices may double on cards or prices may triple they've always stayed stable and they've never retraced more than 10 20 30 percent they've always continued to grow healthily and I think as the community of collectors grow, so will the hobby. You know, will these prices sustain? It really depends on the card, really depends on the circumstance, you know, what's going on in PSA, what's the backlog like, you know, there's a lot of variables in there. But um, overall, yeah, I think YouTube's had an influence and it can only really have an influence because it has an audience 
that is engaged, that actually cares at the end of the day. The demand or the people that, that came uh, last year are, are, are still coming. It's huge. It's a, it's worldwide. It's a worldwide phenomenon. And many people say that it might be even bigger than the Pokemania we faced in the early 2000. I mean, in Europe, UK, and uh, because in Japan it was a bit uh, before that. And uh, that's something very important to bear in mind. The way I like to put it is for 15 years after the last set is made by Pokemon International or Nintendo, the last set they make, the hobby is more than safe for another 10 to 20 years after that. So I'm sure that answers your question, how I feel about the prospects. So there we have it, the thoughts of the world's leading Pokemon experts and their views on how YouTube has shaped and impacted the trading card game. So it's impossible to predict exactly what the future holds for Pokemon cards and whether the prices will remain as they are, but there's no doubt that YouTube and its creators have had a significant impact on Pokemon, and that once again proves the power of YouTube and its creators across the globe. Whether this new resurgence is good for collecting overall remains an interesting topic of debate. There is a section of people online that view Logan Paul's impact on Pokemon cards in a negative light, and they claim to have been priced out of the market completely, but that is all part and parcel of collectibles of any nature. Pokemon is a big part of many of our lives, and for a lot of us growing up, we got to experience that magic, and now, there's a whole new audience being introduced to it and hopefully they can experience the same thing that many of us did when we were younger. When you watch all these videos on YouTube, whether it be about Pokemon gaming or opening packs of cards, even just chatting about the nostalgia of it all, people are having a great time. Pokemon means a lot to many different people. It's basically not only sustained me, but it's uh, taking care, taking care of my retirement. It's kept me close with my children. It's uh, it's just brought me, you know, so much joy. Pokemon for me, I think, has just always kind of been like an escape. It's just been something that I could go to to relax or have fun or just take t take time to enjoy. What Pokemon has uh, done to me, or uh, has brought to me, sorry, is a uh, is. It's very special. A very, a very special connection uh, towards Pokemon. It's it's getting close to being almost everything that I do. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's really tough to caption the words. It's just definitely a major part of my life, and I don't see that changing in the near future. So that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed the video. For anyone interested in watching the full interviews with the Pokemon experts, I'll upload those to my second channel. I'll leave the links in the descriptions below. And if you enjoyed, of course, then also check out some of my other videos. And as usual, please don't subscribe because I probably won't make one of these videos again.